I'm Vladimir Ashkenazi, and I'm very happy and privileged to be a part of this program, uh, Live a Classical Life. <laughs> Mr. Ashkenazi, it's such a delight to welcome you here to my home in Cleveland. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here again. So, I heard you on the radio and you were giving a tribute to him. And you said, I could say to you that he magnetized you like nobody else or that he was playing faster or more powerfully than anybody else. But your tribute to Richter was that it was his devotion and commitment to his art, which will be his legacy. What was Richter's influence on you? I played for him. Actually, I asked him if I could play for you. And I did, and I can't remember exactly what I played. I came to his house in the, in the center of Moscow. I played, I finished, and I thought, oh, what will he say? He said, very good. I said, uh, will you comment on something? No, it was very good. I said, but there's probably something to say. He said, I don't know, maybe. But I liked it so much, I don't want to say anything. You're very good, he said. I wish you all the best. That's how it was. And uh, that gave me some kind of more confidence in me, that, that he actually liked what I'm doing. That's quite something. One of the ideas that we like to explore on this show is for young musicians who aspire to a performing life, how to find that confidence. When you were growing up, did you feel as though you were a naturally confident person? I don't know, that's difficult to try to remember when I was a teenager or whatever. I remember that I learned very fast and I, for some reason I had a very clear understanding of what I should do technically. Uh, lucky me, that's from nature, you know, I can't, um, uh, say that that's my achievement. That nature gives you something and you just follow whatever nature g gave you. Um, so that's how it was. I learned very fast. I played a lot of repertoire and um, that's how I was chosen to, to play at competitions. Uh, people realized that I could do something. So I played at the Chopin competition 55, but I didn't have time to learn the concerto for the <laughs> final. And yes. I didn't even know if I'll get to the final. I did get to the final, and I was number one in the first and second round. Can you imagine? <laughs> but I didn't know the concerto terribly well. So, so I, maybe you were hoping that you wouldn't go to the final round. Uh, I didn't hope anything. I didn't know. Uh, so in the end, I got the second prize because yes. my concerto, I did not terribly well, so I couldn't play it on the same level as the first two rounds. But that's good because, because I received second prize in Chopin competition. I decided to go to another competition. Next, the following year, in 1956, I went to Reine Elisabeth uh, uh, de Belgique in Brussels and I got the first prize there. <laughs> <laughs> Funny life. And then later came the Tchaikovsky competition, yes. Well, the Tchaikovsky, I couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. You see, the authorities, as you know, that the first competition was won by Van Cleven, but American pianist. Can first Tchaikovsky competition, imagine, and uh, uh, won by an American, a representative of, of a capitalist country. Can you imagine? For them, it was very difficult to accept, but there's nothing they could do. He was so much higher in talent and in performance than in, um, all the other candidates. Were you there? Uh, I was there. I, I yes. listened to the yes. performances and I, I admired him very much. And he was so nice and so friendly. Uh, lovely person. Absolutely. Um, so they decided the second competition has to be won by a Soviet, whatever happens. So I was um, uh, asked, uh, almost ordered to to um, play in that competition. And the problem on top of that was that uh, I was already married to a, a foreigner, a capitalist foreigner. My wife was, <laughs> is Icelandic. And, um, and um, they said, if you don't participate in this competition, you have no career. 
Putin. That's so how you Soviet, had no choice. That's how Soviets could behave to you. So I had no choice. I had to participate. And so, um, the Tchaikovsky concerto is not so good for my hands. Octaves and such things, uh, just not f in, uh, physically not good for me. I managed to play it reasonably well. Uh, the first two rounds I was on the top, of course. Uh, so in the end, I managed to share the first prize with John Ogden. John and John Ogden. was a wonderful chap. She was so nice, so gifted, and so friendly. I said, oh, I'm so delighted that I shared the prize with you and everything. So at least I did what the Soviets wanted me to do. So I was back in favor. So would you say that in your life and in your, your musical appearances on stage, was it easy to handle the pressures that you faced? Well, I tried not to uh, admit that there is pressure. I tried to just to concentrate on what I'm doing. And uh, whatever happens, wherever I'm playing in the Carnegie Hall or wherever, uh, I just think, well, I learned it. I better play as I learned it. Try to do my best, whatever happens. Um, it's a difficult situation, of course, each concert well, was for me difficult, uh, psychologically, professionally, but that was my attitude. I was probably brought up well by my teachers. Yeah, They probably instilled in me this attitude, and I uh, incorporated it and became a part of my existence. So I'm very grateful to my uh, upbringing. I wanted to ask about two of your early teachers. One was uh, Armenian, Sympathian. Yeah. What was Sympathian's influence on you? Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to remember now. She realized that I was gifted, and uh, she, um, um, she taught um, a very young boys and girls up to the age of so about 12, 13, 14, 15. And she was a good teacher with that. She realized that I was unusually gifted, talented and everything. And she kept on asking me to play for professors in the conservatory because she was afraid she might not um, do a good job by telling me what to do, how to develop me. And so um, I played for some professors from Moscow Conservatory uh, as I was still in the school with her. Um, and then uh, eventually, uh, one of the very good teachers, uh, who was an assistant of Mr. Oborin. Mr. Zemlyansky. Oborin was a very famous pianist, of course. Uh, Mr. Zemlyansky. Uh, he taught also in, in the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Sumbatian asked me to play for him, too. He liked my playing. And he said, you, I hope you go to Oborin's, because I'm his assistant. And I would take care and that. I would like to help in developing your talent. That's how it was. How was Zemlansky as a teacher and what was his influence on you? I think here in the, the West, nobody knows his name no. or, or what happened no. to him. No. Yeah. No. Um, uh, it's very difficult to remember exactly how the lessons went. But I remember that he was very demanding on me. And when I would not play particularly well, he said, you can't play like this, because your talent is much higher than what you did now. <laughs> so you should be ashamed that you played like this, you know. Yes. Yeah. Even the first time before any lesson. Uh, and I was terribly embarrassed by that. Yes. So I tried to prepare very well. So he was very straightforward, very honest, and he helped me tremendously in my development as a uh, the pianist and as an artist, yes. Was he a performer himself? Uh, no, no, very, very little. Occasionally for some special concert, but he wasn't a performer by nature somehow. But he was a very good musician and a good teacher. He was very uh, demanding in a very kind way, but in a, um, in a way that was really full of meaning. And not just you should play this passage better, no. Just think, what does it mean that you're playing this or this or this? But think of music, think of the pattern, think of what the composer wanted to say. What were the things in your life that, outside of music, that caused your imagination to bring you back to the <laughs> piano? Well, music can embrace everything. But to 
be a little bit humorous. I liked football very much. Really? And I played the... <laughs> 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 not a joke, but not a joke. I really liked it. I went to many games in, in Moscow. Uh, I was supporting Dynamo Moscow team. Yeah, but uh, uh, then, of course, I tried to play, but I realized very early that you might injure your hands. Then you'd <laughs> be regretting all your life, so I decided not to play. When I think back on your, your long musical life and how much you have done, how did you pace yourself so that you would not become exhausted or even injured? It seems that everyone feels they have to say yes in the interest of career. But, uh, well, um, hmm, uh, very difficult. I, of course, I, um, I lived in the Soviet Union, uh, in a country where the attitude to careers and, um, and fame and everything was different than in the West. Mm -hmm. Very, very different, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, we were brought up in a totally different uh, way of our spiritual development, uh, very often very negatively. But in this sense, that uh, um, uh, with the, uh, for artists, for pianists, violinists, and so on, uh, we were very um, isolated from the world, you see. Our concert life uh, was not making a career or anything like that, not at all. It was a totally different system. Uh, if to explain it to you, I would have to talk about what the Soviet system was like but it was so different from the West that it's very difficult to explain it to you. Uh, the main thing was simply to learn as well as you can in your school, uh, uh, and then if, you are, if people like your playing and you, some of your concerts were successful, then the uh, local, I mean, the, the philharmonic societies, so to speak, which were not private, of course, they were all state, uh, uh, enterprises, uh, they might invite you again, and so you play again. Uh, but uh, again, you never thought of a career, of making success, uh, or anything like that. Just you play, you invite it again, you play again. That's how it was. In a way, it was very positive, because you were thinking only of how well you can play, and not to make a career and uh, make a tremendous interest for you and uh, have big fees or anything like that. No, nothing. So that, in a way, was quite positive. Do you think that the career or the musical life that you had is possible to start today without having to resort to commercialism? Yes, That's yes, it's possible. It all depends on your state of mind and what is important for you. And if you go for the fame and, uh, and financial um, development, you have a problem. Just think of the music. If you play well, try again, try again, play well. Don't go for the career, just go for the music you're playing. And uh, of course, there are some very successful people in the West who probably are like this. They're not going for the career, for the money, for the fame, but they want to play well. That is the main thing. And whatever happens to you, that's what I am for. I have a gift, I develop my gift, Whatever it brings me, if it brings me only $1,000, fine. So maybe sometimes I have five, who cares? But the main thing is my development as an artist, as a human being, as a musician. That's what it is. And some people are like this, of course. When you came to the West and you saw the type of commercialism that was different from what you described in the Soviet Union, did you feel allergic to it? Uh, yes, uh, well, as I said, um, I, I knew what I would do. I knew that I had a certain way, certain attitude to my life, to my music. Um, and uh, I married a musician, an Icelandic lady, who, who was, is a pianist, who was a very good pianist. And uh, of course, with my constant contact, uh, it was very helpful. Um, so I understood in the West even more by my marriage, too. So I'm very lucky in this way. Tell me, what is the role of family in your life? Is there room in such a busy life for family? Oh, yes, whatever you can do for your family, you would do. We have five children, and um, two of them are very good musicians. Um, um, 
well, it's, 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 it's a long story to tell you about how it all developed, but um, we managed, my wife, I don't know how she managed to travel with me and take care of the children. It's quite incredible. But uh, we are very happy with our children. Basically, it's a very good relationship. Did you feel like your musical and artistic identity was directly connected with piano? Was it a difficult transition to go to conducting? Uh, 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 no, you know, uh, I loved symphony orchestra from my childhood. So I spent all my free time going to orchestral concerts. Even when I started playing the piano and started being sort of successful with, it, with my piano playing. So I went to only one or two piano recitals by Richter and Gilles, because those played really like symphony orchestras. <laughs> But otherwise, I spent all my time buying scores, whatever I could get in the Soviet Union. They weren't so, uh, they didn't publish so much of that. But I, all my life, all my um, youth at that time, I spent going to orchestral concerts. I was there nonstop all the time, and I learned so much repertoire, you can't imagine. But of course, mostly very much Russian repertoire, some Beethoven, some Brahms, not so much. So it was quite limited. So when I found myself that I started traveling to the West, I started buying um, scores and uh, um, records. That was uh, uh, big, big records at that time, of course, 33. Uh, and um, I became, because I went to, uh, to Warsaw, then to Brussels, then to America, and I brought suitcases full of records and scores and I became a point of interest from many conductors who maybe didn't travel as much as I did and they said we know that you have this could we borrow this please I would let them have it but sometimes they wouldn't return it <laughs> unfortunately um, but, um, uh, but that was my life I was just growing up on traveling to the West, getting all the music, all the records, all the scores and everything. And of course, practicing the piano, of course, like crazy too. But uh, my development uh, as a musician went like this, parallel. Uh, my association with the symphony orchestra was there from, from my very early age. I never thought I would conduct. And when finally, uh, Mr. Rozdestvensky realized that I love orchestral music so much that I better do something about it. He was in the same school, Central Music School, uh, just a few years older than me. He said, why don't you conduct? Because he was so interested. In I said, but I don't know, it's too complicated. He said, well, come to, come to my apartment. I, I wanted to. I play something and you conduct me. So he played something and I sort of did something that he said, yeah, okay. You know, he's, you conduct musically. Of course, you don't have any technique. But, you know, I'll show you a few things, you know. And he started showing me a little bit. And I thought I would never do it in any case. But then uh, people in my, in my school, uh, they asked me to conduct the school orchestra. So I did a little bit. And I said, but I can't conduct yet. I have no experience or anything. But I did something, and they played. I said, well, is it okay? They said, yeah, you will love it. But I said, I have no technique. Doesn't matter, but we know what you want to do, and we follow it. Well, that's how it started, you know? So I realized that maybe I could really do it. But I need to learn all the things, you know? By now, of course, I've learned quite a lot. <laughs> is it easier for you to be on stage as a conductor or as a pianist? Uh, I don't know. I hardly play uh, publicly now myself on the piano. I record, of course, I practice every day. Uh, um, but I don't know what's easier. Uh, it's impossible to compare. You know, the responsibility is great, whether you play the piano only and just by yourself, or when you conduct an orchestra. When you conduct an orchestra, obviously, it all depends on what you do. So many people are sitting in front of you, sometimes nearly 100 people. So can you imagine the responsibility? That you have to be clear and yet express something. So that's, I hope I can do it. I hope, I hope so. Uh, with the piano, nobody can help you. 
<laughs> orchestral musicians, if they like what you do, they help. Piano, just yourself. So it's a difficult proposition. And finally, you left the Soviet Union, but do you still feel connected to the Russian soul? I suppose so. And what does the Russian soul mean to you? <laughs> um, every person who is brought up in a certain um, um, area of mankind um, has what we call soul. What is soul? It's an inner, inner understanding of our existence. That's what the soul is, I suppose. Um, what can I say about this? I was brought up in the sense that I should understand why I exist. I should understand that other people are very important, just as, as much important as you. Their life is just as important as your life. Uh, um, I was never uh, um, taught to think that our soul is the most important thing, Russian soul. Uh, and if some people said it, I would probably reply, oh, what is soul? Everybody has a soul. The Germans have souls, French have souls, uh, people from Africa have souls. Why our, is our soul different, so important? We all have it. And uh, our most important point is to, um, to understand and to communicate with everybody in the world and to uh, think that you might be different, but you're not that, that different to be um, above some other people. That's ridiculous. Um, so that's the way I led my life all the time. And I felt very happy about this. Uh, that's the best I can say. Mr. Ashkenazi, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you for all the inspiration that you have given to me and to others. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. It was nice to talk to you. Nice to talk. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>